going to continue with um, Acts, our study in Acts, the unfinished story. And this morning we're going to be looking at the gospel goes to Europe. Um, now, if you'll remember last time, I, I appreciated your patience and I took, a, I took longer last time. And I, and I told you, I said, I said, I'm gonna have to give you, I'll give you a short time one time. I don't know if it's gonna be this Sunday or not, because we're gonna cover quite a few verses. Um, this Sunday morning, but uh, Lord helping us, we're gonna we're gonna go pretty quickly through um, through this section. And it was interesting to me uh, as Pastor Renee was was advertising um, for anxious for nothing this morning, which is based on Philippians chapter four verses four through f four through eight. Almost all of us or many of us have that memorized. It begins with rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near, the Lord is near, and then so on. And um, I think the Lord arranged the timing that as we come into this study uh, about Philippians, that, uh, of, uh, sorry, into this study of Philippians, they were also right at the place in our study of Acts where Paul goes to this great city of Philippi, where there are no believers. The gospel has not yet gone to Europe. The, the gospel has not yet gone west. It has been, it has stayed in Palestine. It has stayed in what was called Asia at that time, but what we would call Turkey today, that seems a little bit unusual to us. And Paul, who was a godly man and was full of the Holy Spirit with other people who were full of the Holy Spirit, kept on trying to, well, I'll go north. And the Holy Spirit said no. He tried to go south, probably towards Ephesus. That's where that, that large city was uh, uh, in the southern part of Turkey. He probably started to go towards Ephesus. And the Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, again said no and would not let him. And so he just had to wait. Okay, so they got as far as Troas and then waited. And then the Holy Spirit gave supernatural direction. We learned so much from that as we looked a couple of weeks ago that the Holy Spirit leads us and he guides us. He gives us correction. Remember we talked about that, that example of, of going in a direction and you're going the wrong way. So we shouldn't be afraid of the correction of the Holy Spirit. We don't want it, do we? If we talk about correction, it's like, no, 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 no. N not, none of us wants to be corrected. But the, the, the correction of the Holy Spirit is always good for us. It's always good for us. Because if we're not corrected and we're going the wrong way, we're going to get in trouble. We're going, to bring, we're going to bring harm to ourselves. And so the Holy Spirit, because He loves us, will correct us at times. And then at other times, we need direction. Well, what should I be doing then? Where should I be going? And the Holy Spirit, because He's God, part of His portfolio, one of the main parts of His portfolio is to give us direction. Are there other things as well? But He gives us direction, and I'm so thankful for that. Because you and I both know, as we go through our lives and go through our days, there are things that we face and decisions we have to make. We cannot go directly to the Word of God and find the answer for what we need to do. We can find principles, but we don't always know how to apply the principles either, do we? And so the Holy Spirit is there and He gives us direction. And then that third thing that we looked at was sometimes the Holy Spirit gives encouragement, which we also need. How many of you have needed encouragement at times? You're going the right way, you're doing what you think you're supposed to be doing, but you've gotten tired. Uh, you're not sure, is this really what I'm supposed to be doing? And the Holy Spirit comes alongside and says, Jayo, or whatever you say in Cantonese. What do we say in Cantonese? How do we add oil? Gayao, gayao, <laughs> or, or, or come on, keep going. And the Holy Spirit does that. You know, I, I, I'm not trying to be disrespectful of the Holy Spirit, but I, I think sometimes we sort of think of him as woo. And he's really very, very practical. Just as Jesus walked with his disciples day by day by day, the feet got dust, their feet got dusty, they got tired, but he led them and he guided them. The Holy Spirit is the same God. He's the same God who is with you day by day. He knows when you get discouraged. He knows when you're tired. He knows when you are just sad. Do you ever get sad? Some, we just get sad sometimes. And some of you are looking at me like, 
it'll happen, believe me. <laughs> Things happen, and the Holy Spirit is right there with us, and He knows, but not only does He know, He cares. He cares, and oh, that encourages my heart. It should encourage your heart as well. And He's not hands-off, He's hands-on in our lives. And so we see Paul and this group, the Holy Spirit corrects, directs, and encourages, and then he gives Paul this vision of the man from Macedonia. Maybe he was dressed in a special way, or maybe he had a, a special uh, accent, or spoke in a special way, or maybe there was a glowing sign overhead that said, I am from Macedonia, or something. We don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us, but they understood this man is from Macedonia, and the man pleads. That's a, that's a strong word, isn't it? He doesn't just invite and say, hey, come over here. There is a pleading, please come over and help us. I, I think that was the voice of the Holy Spirit. We look around us and we see people around us that um, look very self-sufficient. They look like they've got it all together. They look like they know what they're doing. They look like everything is okay in their lives. But the Holy Spirit it knows what's going on behind closed doors. The Holy Spirit knows what's going on behind that smile. The Holy Spirit knows what's going on behind this, the, the fancy suit and the, and the big bank account. And today, we're going to meet three people fr from Philippi, each one very, very different. We're gonna meet a businesswoman who seems like she has it all together, but she needs Jesus. We're gonna meet a demon-possessed slave girl who definitely needs Jesus, so clearly. And we're going to meet a civil servant, a jailer. You say, well, a jailer's a civil servant. He would have been in Roman culture, who seems to have so much power, right? He had the, he had the power to, to jail or free people, and yet he is himself in bondage, bondage, and he needs Jesus also. And so as we look at these three Christians from Philippi, um, we're going to learn something about ourselves, and we're, we're going to see how the Holy Spirit still speaks to us today as well. Okay, so you've got to do something there. There we go. <laughs> okay, and so they've made it as far as Troas. We'll just look. I'm going to put a lot of scriptures up here this morning. I'm not going to read all of them, but if you have your handout, uh, you'll see on the front of the handout, I've just given... Um, I've given you basic information, and then if you want to take notes, you can look, turn to the back page, and you can take some notes there, and we'll get to there, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in just a minute. I'm going to put this right over here. And so they make it as far as Troas. That's where Paul has the vision, and then they immediately, I love that, as soon as they know what God's will is, they do it. Let me ask you something this morning. How many of us, as soon as we know God's will, we do it? Or do we hesitate? Do we think about it for a little while? Do we get, we say, well, let me, I'm not sure. Let, let me consider it. Oh, let us learn a lesson from Paul and his team. As soon as they, they determine this is God's will, they do it. May I say to you that the greatest blessing of God on your life and mine will always be when we obey immediately. When we obey immediately. Um, it honors the Lord and it brings God's blessing into our lives. So they go there. They stop partway. There's an island right in the middle that's not marked. It's called Samothrace. They spend the night there because it was dangerous to travel at night. There were, uh, there were rocky shores and, and reefs and things nearby. So they overnight there and then they make it to Neapolis. Uh, Neapolis means new city, right? So the, some of you who are I don't know if you should be or not. You're fans of the Matrix movies, right? There's the famous character Neo, right? Which means new. And polis means city. So it's new city. Uh, and there would have been a lot of other cities named that as well. So they make it there. Here's the scripture for us. Uh, they go immediately. They land there. Neapolis is right here, and it's about nine miles away from Philippi. And Neapolis is the port city for Philippi. And then they reach Philippi, a major city of that district of Macedonia. Uh, you say, where's Macedonia? Macedonia is this whole area, um, and it's what today we would know mostly as, uh, as Greece. Well, much of this area would be, would be considered Greece today. So this gives us an idea. And Philippi is a Roman colony, and we stayed there several days. So that tells us they arrived there, and they didn't immediately run out and do things. They, they waited there for... Um, 
for just a little bit. Now let's talk about Philippi for just a little bit. Uh, if we see that the name is Philippi, that might give us some idea from whence its name came, <laughs> okay? Um, Philippi was named after somebody called? There you go, named Philip. And it was named after Philip of Macedon, Macedon, Macedonia. Philip of Macedon, a lot of you are saying, what? Okay, so you're not familiar with Philip of Macedon, but you are familiar with his son. And his son was Alexander the Great. Okay, Alexander the Great. But Philip of Macedon, his father, conquered this whole area and he named this city after himself. It was a wonderful city. It was very rich. There were mountains nearby and there were gold mines in the mountains. And Philip uh, had uh, slaves and servants that mined the gold from, uh, that out of these mountains and he used it to build his big army and to build his kingdom. And Alexander the Great profited from that. So there were gold mines there. But not only that, it was on a beautiful plain and it was very fertile. And so the city was rich. But the citizens of Philippi were most proud not of the fact that there were gold mines, nor that they were named after Philip of Macedon, nor that they were on a fertile plain, but they were most proud of the fact that they were a Roman colony. This meant that if they were from that city, they were Roman citizens. Let me ask you something this morning. Uh, most of us in this room, we have different passports. We are citizens of various countries. And if I were to ask you, um, few of us would, would want to change our nationalities, right? We love the countries that, where we were born, right? Um, God, put, that, God brought, put us there. We were born in those places. But if you could change your passport for another passport, would you do that? Keep your nationality. But if you could choose perhaps the most valuable passport in the world, or the, most, uh, uh, the one that has the most benefits in the world, would you do that? Probably a lot of us would do that. You could go through, um, you could visit almost any, some of Steve is in the back going. <laughs> we love the countries we're from. But this gives us an, an idea. And we live in, in, in most of us come, are, are come from countries that are relatively free, uh, good societies. But think about those days. It would have been very different. Um, most of these areas were subject to Rome. They were, uh, they were enslaved. They were not free. So imagine being the citizen of a colony and you were a citizen because you were a colony of Rome. That meant like, that meant you were Rome. You were Roman. You were, it was Rome away from Rome, and that meant you had all the rights of Roman citizens. You were free from taxation. How many of you would love not to pay taxes? <laughs> I get a double whammy as an American a, 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 from the U.S. I pay taxes in Hong Kong, and I pay taxes in the U.S. too. It's a bummer. <laughs> it's a bummer. But it was, they didn't have to pay taxes. They had the right to vote. They were self-governing, and they had a little wooden passport. How many of you, you know, I told you I'm getting ready to go to the U.S., and, and I have, they had a wooden passport, and I've got a little paper passport, but they had a little wooden passport that they would often carry with them, or a, a, an identity plaque that said they were citizens of Rome. And that's what the citizens of Philippi had, so they were really proud. That's why, and, they, and so um, in this city, on the, on the mountain right above the city was a huge Roman fort. That's why when you come to Philippians 4, when Paul writes to these Philippians who are now Christians, when he says, and the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, remember that part of the verse? All of these Philippian Christians would have gone ding. They would immediately have understood the picture and the imagery because that word guard is the same word as a garrison or a fort. You know, over here, not far from, uh, 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 what's that hill over there called where the PLA soldiers are? Right over here. Not Beacon Hill. It's not Beacon Hill. What is this over here? Bar barracks? But Barrack Hill? What is this one right over here? You know on the corner? Oh. 
We are such bad Hong Kong citizens. What's it called? Just right over here near the church. I know where it is. What is it called? <laughs> Gun Barracks Hill, or something like that. Anyhow, right over here. Um, and if something were to happen, if, if somebody were to invade Hong Kong, we would be safe. All of the soldiers would come flooding out of that place and we would be protected. Well, the Philippian, the Philippian citizens knew we're safe because there's a great fort there and all of these Roman soldiers are there. And so they understood when Paul wrote the peace of God will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Wow, how many of us need that guard over our hearts and minds when the enemy throws air, shoots arrows at you and fear grabs your heart and the peace of God guards your hearts and minds. That's one of the reasons we are pushing and advertising so strongly for this study, Anxious for Nothing. We get anxious about things sometimes that will never happen. But if the enemy has robbed our peace and made us worried and has kept us from sleeping at night, he's already won and we've lost. And God guards us from that. So the Philippians understood that. But as we come to this part of the story, there are no Christians in Philippi. The only Christians are Paul, Silas, Luke and young Timothy. And so as they come into this place in Philippi, we're going to be introduced to three Christians um, and we're going to meet the very first European Christian. Is it a big deal to go from here to here? It's a pretty big deal because this will be the first time the gospel comes to Europe. So <coughs> let's look at Acts 6. 16, 13 through 15, and we're going to go through the story. I don't want to read it all. You can look at it, and we're familiar with this story anyhow. Uh, they go on the Sabbath day, and they don't go to a synagogue. Why don't they go to a synagogue in the city? That's what Paul always did, right? Why don't they go? There's no synagogue. There's no synagogue. This is a Roman colony. There, are, there aren't, uh, to have a synagogue in those days, even today, there have to be a minimum of 10 Jewish men. You say, well, that sounds a little sexist. It was. Um, but there had to be 10 Jewish men. There weren't even 10 Jewish men. No synagogue in the city. And so they did, according to custom, they went out by the river and they knew that probably if there were Jews in the city, they would be out by the river meeting for prayer. So they make their way out to the edge of the city and sure enough, there is a group gathered there and they are worshiping God. You say, oh, they're Christians. Nope, they were Jewish and they worshiped the God of the Old Testament. They didn't know about Jesus. They kept the Old Testament law. And the first, first person we meet, he, we sat down to speak with some women who had gathered there. So what does that tell us? Does that tell us that Paul is doing like I'm doing this morning? Here, he's got all his notes and he's dressed up nicely and he's preaching? No, this means that he just had a conversation with them and that was common to do. So Paul sits down and he begins to talk with them and the first person we meet is Lydia from Thyatira, a merchant of expensive purple cloth who worshiped God. You say, are you sure she's not a Christian? She worshiped God. That's the Old Testament, that's the, uh, uh, for, from Judaism, so not born again. She doesn't yet know the freedom that comes from Jesus Christ. And so here's this Lydia. What do we see about her and what do we know about her? I've put that there because that's some of the old cloth from there. She was a merchant, so she's a businesswoman. How many of you are business people this morning? You would perhaps fit in this category. And she was a dealer in purple cloth, so that tells us something else. She was wealthy. I say, are you sure? Pretty sure. Um, the purple dye that they used for to make the purple cloth to make one gram, okay, sorry, you know I'm North American, so the grams and the things I'm not so good at, but a gram is not a lot, right? One gram of dye took 10,000 shellfish that had been ground up and had a purple color in them. 10,000 10, shellfish. And then they would grind it up and they'd put salt water in it it must have been a terrible smell and then they would let it ferment for about 10 days and then they would extract the dye. One pound of wool that had been dyed was worth the same as one pound of gold. 
Okay, so that's a pound of wool that was dyed, worth a pound of gold. And pr this purple dye was worth more, just the dye itself was worth more than its weight in gold. And so she was a dealer in purple. And because it was so expensive, it was used first just by the emperors, and then by the nobility, and then as Philippi was a fairly wealthy city, then the very wealthiest would begin to use this dye. And it, was, it, was, it would range from purple to a dark red, and it was especially loved because it didn't fade. They've even found some tombs. When you look at this, this, this seems like, oh, well, it's quite bright when you look at these colors, but this piece of cloth is over a thousand years old almost 2,000 years old. So when you see this, that tells you something about the quality of the dye. And so this Lydia um, is out by the river with other Jews. She's not Jewish. She is Greco-Roman uh, because she's from Thyatira, but she has rejected the idolatry and the immorality of the pagan religions, and she's searching for truth. I want to say something to you this morning, brothers and sisters, especially those of you that have a lot to do with people that seem very successful and that seem to have it all together. I challenge you to look not with natural eyes, but to look beyond the facade, because underneath people are all the same. And here's this Lydia who seems to have it all together, but she was hungry for more. And as Paul begins to speak, what do we read? As she listened, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention, and she accepted what Paul was saying. Here's this beautiful picture. Do you see the two parts right here this morning? May I say to you this morning, brothers and sisters, you are saved, you're full of the Holy Spirit. It always takes two parts. Listen, it always takes two parts. God will not do it without you. And you cannot do it without God. It takes both parts. And Paul is there in obedience to the will of God, sharing. He's just talking with them. And then God opens her heart. You do your part. God will do his part. And Lydia is the first European Christian that we meet. You're going to meet her in heaven one day. Isn't that great? You're going to meet her in heaven one day. And she responds to the gospel. And then she was baptized. Ah, oh, May 1st, coming up in about, let's see. <laughs> we're, near the, we're getting near the end of, oh, we're halfway through February, but March, April, in about two months, two months plus, we're going to have water baptism. If you've not yet been water baptized and Jesus lives in your hearts, it's time. It's time. This, in the early church world, this was the first thing people did when they believed. It really was. They believed. They were baptized. They were baptized. It's an identification with Jesus. And so she believed and she was baptized. Not only was she baptized, but obviously the members of her household, they also believed. That also tells us that she was wealthy. And so <coughs> she asked us to be her guests. So here she is, first Christian in Europe. Yay! Lydia. And Paul actually refers to her, although not by name, a little bit later. We're going to look at that in just a minute. Um, but I want to lift her up as an example for us this morning. And some of us may say, well, how is she, uh, how is she an example to me? I want you to look at verse 15 right here at the example that she is. She's baptized. That's the first thing that happens. And then I want you to see what comes out of her life immediately. What comes out of her life? What is the expression of Christian life that we see immediately, immediately? There's a word for it. It's one of the gifts, but it's more than one of the gifts. It's one of the commands as well. Hospitality. Very, very simply. Hospitality. And she says to them, if you really believe I'm a Christian, if you really believe that I'm, I'm a true believer in the Lord, ooh, how are you going to fight against that one, right? Um, it's a strong, compelling uh, argument, isn't it? Uh, uh, or invitation. She said, please come stay with me. Now this was welcome indeed because in those days, inns were really brothels. I mean, they weren't much more than that. They were terrible places. So you can imagine for these four Christian 
men to be able to stay in a Christian home and to be provided for and cared for was a wonderful thing. But notice also that Paul and his gang don't immediately take advantage because sometimes people take advantage of well-meaning and wealthy believers, right? to get what they can. We've all seen it. We've all seen it. But they don't do that. She has to urge them to come, and then they come to the house. Uh, they come to stay with her. When you read this a little bit later, do you know what else you will find? You will find that later on, Lydia's home becomes the new church. How great is that? It begins with hospitality. It continues with a home for the first church of Europe. A home for a church that if you read the New Testament, do you know what you will find? It seemed that Paul had some favorites. We're not supposed to have favorites, are we? I think Paul had favorites. Do you know who his favorites were? The Philippians. If you look at your notes, we're going to look at some things. A little bit later, when Paul writes to the Philippians, do you know what he calls them? He calls them my joy and my crown. Wow, wouldn't that warm your heart if the person who had led you to the Lord wrote back to you and said, you're my joy and my crown. You bring joy to my heart, you bring honor to my life. That's what that means. And we see in Lydia this immediate and natural overflow and response of hospitality. And you may be wondering, well, Pastor Jennifer, why are you talking about this? We could be talking about other things. I want to talk about this for just a little bit because I think it's really important. And I think we as modern Christians don't give enough importance to hospitality. I don't want to spank us, but I'm going to spank us just a little bit this morning. I think most of us these days, we live busy lives. We come to church on Sundays or in the rest of the week as well. And when I'm at church on Sundays, what do we want? I don't want to host anybody. I don't want to invite anybody. I just want to be with my friends at lunchtime, the people I'm comfortable with. We're going to go eat here or whatever. I don't know them very well. It won't be so comfortable if they go with us to lunch. I, it's going to cost extra. Now, brothers and sisters, I know I'm stepping on some toes this morning. But you know that's true. You know that's true. And what I want to say to you is this. We take it lightly, but I don't think God does. Because when you look at the New Testament, do you know what? For a widow to be supported by the church, she had to practice hospitality. For a man or woman to be chosen as an elder, an overseer of the church, what Pastor Renee and I do, do you know what one of the requirements was? And it's mentioned several times. One of the requirements was they have to be hospitable. What? A pastor, a preacher, an elder has to be hospitable? That's what the Bible says. Now before we say, yeah, but I'm just a, I'm an average Christian. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a whatever. And I'm not a widow looking for support from the church. Let me give you some other verses. Okay? Ready? If you want to argue, you go talk to God about it. This is in the Bible. Okay, let's look at these and it's on your notes as well. Romans 12, 13, when God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Ouch, right? Because we're, not, we're often not eager, right? You know, I, I hate it. You know, sometimes when there are visitors at Lighthouse, some of you know, I have come around to you and I've said, have you gone over to talk to them? Yeah, and the, and the visitor will be kind of standing there. And it grieves my heart. It really does. It really does. Or like, hello, yes, I've already talked with them. And then we go on. What I want to say to you is that God sees hospitality as a basic Christian grace. It, re it really is. It really is. Let's look at another verse. 1 Peter 4, 9. Um, Peter, <laughs> Peter says, be hospitable to one another without complaining. <laughs> How many of us are hospitable and then after we've been hospitable we fuss about it <laughs> later? A lot of us do. And we're laughing about that because do you know what? Hospitality, honestly brothers and sisters, hospitality costs something. It really does. It may take something from our pocketbooks, but it will always take something from our hearts, won't it? It really does. And I think that's why the Bible says that. May I say to you, those in Lighthouse that I see practicing gracious hospitality, 
I want to say you bless my heart when I see your generous hospitality. Just you're open and you invite people. Even if you don't pay for the meal, come with us. Well, let's, let's do this. Let's do that. It's such a, it, it blesses my heart. And it's an encouragement to me also to be more hospitable. And so I encourage you, brothers and sisters, to be more hospitable because God says to. God says to. And it's one of the basic Christian graces. Look at one more. Hebrews 13, 2. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers, people we don't know, people that come in. <coughs> For some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. Without realizing it. I, I love this verse. Do you know of any time when this has happened? I do in the Bible. But I'll bet it's happened at other times as well. Remember Abraham? He saw people walking and he says, please, 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 please come to my tent. Please come to my tent. And Abraham himself offered hospitality to two angels and God. And God. And out of that, God shared what was ahead. So I want to encourage you and I really want to challenge you, brothers and sisters. If hospitality, if you and I are reluctant in this area, I want you to, I want to, to, I want to encourage you to do what Nike says. Just do it. <laughs> okay? Just do it. Just do it. And may I say to you that when we do in obedience what we don't want to do, the Lord will give us grace. Amen? He really will. And you and I will come to the place where we rejoice in doing it and you don't know what blessing it will bring. Okay. So here's we're talking about Lydia and then I want you to look at Philippians 4.15 because this was written a few years afterwards and then Paul writes back and he says moreover as this is this is in your notes by the way moreover as you Philippians know in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel when I set out from Macedonia not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only may I say something to you when you and I do what God says to do when we are generous when we share when we are hospitable not only do we bless the recipient we are blessed and the church of God is strengthened and encouraged your good works and I'm not talking about good works to for salvation you know I'm not talking about that your good works encourage other Christians did you know that when people see you doing good when people see you doing what is right and doing as Christians should do it encourages other people to do what is right as well it really does it really does and sometimes it's an encouragement sometimes it may even be a little bit of a rebuke oh I should be doing that and I haven't been doing that and I love the example of Lydia because she's such a positive example I believe that when Paul writes to the Philippians he says, in the early days of your acquaintance, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. Why was the Philippian church so generous with Paul? Many reasons, but I believe one in part was because the very first Christian of the church of Philippi was a woman named Lydia who had a generous heart, had a generous heart, and others followed her example. They followed her example. Look at one more scripture at the beginning. I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you. Let me ask you something this morning. Be ready to say ouch. When people remember you, do they give thanks? <laughs> or do they say, oh yeah. <laughs> I always pray with joy for you for all of you in my every prayer. So when people pray for you, do they pray with joy? Oh, Lord, thank you for them. Or is it, oh, Lord, help them again. They're <laughs> I, now, I'm laughing a little bit, but honestly, I read this and I, I was kind of convicted. I thought, I wonder if that's how people think of me when they pray for me. What a testimony, isn't it? What a testimony that this is how Paul thinks of this church because they were such a they, there was a, a love relationship there they were a, they were a gracious church and he says because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now what do you mean from the first day until now Lydia the very first day she met them come stay at my house that's partnership in the gospel brothers and sisters 
That's partnership in the gospel. And so here, years later, this is almost 10 years after Philippians, uh, after, after Paul visited Philippi. And he mentions, not by name, but I believe Lydia is pictured right here from the very first day you partnered with me. And you and I can have partnership in this. And these are, I love these scriptures. You may not have thought about it um, th before. But I want to encourage you because I think we take the directive for generosity and for hospitality, I think we take it too lightly. Don't you think so? Most of us should just nod our head and say, yep, we take it too lightly. I believe we should take it more to heart than we have. And so we meet Lydia. <laughs> And she partners with them in the gospel. And Paul remembers her and the Philippian church with great joy. And then <coughs> they're staying at Lydia's house. And as they're going back and forth from her house to the place of prayer, still no synagogue, they meet somebody else. Very different from Lydia, but another female. And who's the next person they meet? Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a demon-possessed slave girl who had a spirit by which, by which she predicted the future. Y'all, you can't get further from east to west, from north to south, from dark to light than from Lydia to a demon-possessed slave girl, can you? Diametrically opposed, diametrically opposed opposite. You hear you have Lydia, she has it all together, she's wealthy, she is her own, uh, she is her own boss, she has her own home, everything is going well, she has servants, she probably has slaves herself in the household, that would be, that would be most likely. And then here we meet, some days later, this slave girl. We don't read Greek, but if we could read Greek, Greek we, would, we would understand from the Greek that this girl was really young. You know some of those young girls that were seated right over here where, that Chaco and Cherry bring to church? How old are those girls? 11, 10, 9, 10, 11, around there. This slave girl was very possibly 9, 10, or 11. We sometimes think of a, a woman, but the original language implies she was very young. Think with me of, uh, of the difference between these two. Whenever God begins to work, the enemy also begins to work. Have you ever made a stand for God? Have you ever made a decision, God, I'm going to whatever? And it's not very long before the enemy comes in to oppose you, right? It's not very long before the enemy begins to fight you. That's what the enemy always does. So I just want to, you know, just take a note. When you stand for God, God the enemy will oppose you, but God will be with you, as we're going to see here. So the gospel's taking root, and so the enemy comes in. Now in other places, the enemy has attacked directly, head on, boom. And sometimes that's how the enemy fights, right? He comes at you like a raging bull or a roaring lion. But he doesn't always come that way. Sometimes he comes in by association and compromise. And that's what happens here. So they meet this demon-possessed slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. Without discernment, the work of God will be diluted, distracted, and destroyed in Philippi. God does not need advertisement from the world to verify that he is the one true God. He has you and he has me. And this slave girl follows along behind Paul and Silas and Luke and Timothy for days, shouting out loud a great advertisement. These men are servants of the Most High God who's showing you the way of salvation. Now, if we didn't know any better, we'd think, praise the Lord. I've got some free advertisement here, right? But Paul is full of the Holy Spirit and he knows this is not from God and I don't want it. And it can't be mixed with God's work because any time it's the devil's work that's mixed with God's work, destruction will happen. It, it will always happen. And so you can't mix it. You can't mix it. But I want you to think about this, this poor girl. So she's very young. She's 9, 10, or 11. Where are her, let me ask you, do you remember when you were 9, 10, or 11? What if you, at age 9, 10, or 11, had no family around you, no mother to care for you, 
no father to provide for you, no brothers and sisters. And not only would you be separated from your family, but you would be in the wretched condition of being a slave of somebody else, and not just one person, because later it says when the owners, it's almost like each one of these owners had a stake in her because she was valuable, right? It's almost like a valuable, like they have an investment in her because there's more than one owner of this slave girl. She was really valuable to them. Imagine that, imagine that, that, that she's a slave, so she's used by them, Take it one step further, and she's demon-possessed. So she's in torment. What a wretched, pitiful state of bondage this girl is in. How awful. We, we read the Bible, and we read it too quickly, and we forget that these are flesh and blood people, and they're real people. We're going to meet this slave girl in heaven one day no longer a slave. For he whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Amen, amen, amen. amen. That's why I, I loved so much the songs we were singing this morning. I know that the Holy Spirit directed Panina in those songs that she chose for us to uh, with which to worship the Lord this morning, because this is what we're talking about this morning. And so Paul takes it, um, and, and I want to just say something to you, and I know our time is coming very close to an end, but I want to say something to you this morning. In this area, now this says that she was demon-possessed and she made money for her owners by fortune-telling. In this type of thing, there are those that are fake and they're 100% fake, right? Yeah. There are those that are real and they're 100% real. It's not from God, but it's real, right? It's real. There's knowledge and there's power. And then there are those that are in the middle and it's a mixture of kind of fake stuff and, and, and some real stuff as well. If it's any one of those three, nevertheless, don't have anything to do with it. Is there power there? Yes, there's power, but it's not from God. Is there knowledge there? Yes, there is, but it's not from God. And as we're going to see in a minute, all knowledge is God's and all power is God's. Stay away from it. You know why I urge you to stay away from it and just say, don't even get near it. Stay away from horoscopes. Stay away from fortune tellers. Stay away from feng shui. Stay away from, you name it. Just stay away from it. Do you know why I say stay away? Because if you open the door in curiosity, do you know what the devil will do? I promise you, something will come true. It will come true. You say, Uncle oh, gang, uh, don't be gang, you know? I mean, don't be gang, because God is, uh, don't be afraid. hi <laughs> pa. okay? Don't be afraid, um, because all power is God's and all knowledge is God's. But the devil has power and the devil has knowledge. And when you and I open the door, he will, he'll do something to hook you. Something will happen, something will be real, something will be true. So just stay away from it. But I will tell you this, if you absolutely want to give, some, give somebody some money to find out your future, come to me, give me some money, and I will tell you your future. Surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life, and you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How about that? There, you got that free, and you don't even have to give me any money, okay? Stay away from it. Stay away from it. And Paul handles it, as, and we could say so much more about that, but enough said. You know that, right? You know that. And then she finally, Paul, he can't take it anymore, and he turns around and he says, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. Notice something here. He doesn't tell this girl, girl, shut up. Little girl, go home. He doesn't say, little girl, please go away. He doesn't do that. Why? Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers. By the way, that verse is in your note as well. That, those, those, words are, uh, th those verses are in your note as well. And he deals with the problem. The problem's not the person. The problem's not that little slave girl. She has a problem too. She's demon possessed and she's a slave and she's being used by ruthless owners. She needs freedom. And so Paul deals with the problem. Listen, brothers and sisters, don't get hung up on people that, are cause, that you think are causing you problems. It's usually the enemy. L talk to God. Let God deal with that 
let God deal with the enemy and he'll take care of it. And so he turns around and I love this. At that moment, the spirit left her. Don't be afraid. Don't be, oh, don't whatever. Don't get into superstitious stuff. Trust in God. He has all power. He has all knowledge. And immediately the spirit comes out. And I want to give you, so remember this. Here's the whole passage. But um, I've just, <coughs> I, I love this. I think this is Holman. Uh, Christian standard, maybe ESV. Be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength whenever you feel weak. His strength is vast. But especially verse 12, our fight is not against people on earth, but against the rulers and authorities and powers of this world's darkness. This is why you must put on Christ's full armor. So we see that. And that's what Paul does. And that's what Paul has. And then look at Luke 4, 18 and 19. You know why I love this passage with this passage? Who wrote the Gospel of Luke? The earthly author of the Gospel of Luke? Who was it? The same one that wrote Acts. The same one that wrote Acts. And Luke records the words of Jesus when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And what did, the, what did he say in the power of the Spirit? Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So we come to a close this morning as we look at this slave girl who was set free. Please don't get hung up on the fact, well, Pastor Jennifer, it doesn't say that she joined the church and she became a Christian. Come on. You honestly think that Paul would deliver her in the name of Jesus and then let her go on in her miserable condition? Of course not. Of course not. She becomes, there's no question that salvation comes to her heart as well. But we close with this this morning. We'll get to the jailer next time, which actually works well because I actually had a lot more I wanted to say about the jailer and I was cutting it really short. So you can hang on to your papers. But I wanted to close with this as we make a present day application from this slave girl, just as we did with Lydia and hospitality. Jesus who set that slave girl free is the same Jesus here today who sets us free. And some of us here this morning are in bondage. You have been, maybe you have been set free, you have been saved, you've been spirit filled, but you're living under, you're living under a cloud. You're living with oppression. You're living with bondage. The enemy is coming against you. I spoke with, we want to close with this example, then we're going to pray, but let the Holy Spirit, Jesus, the Spirit of Jesus is here to set us free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Lord, when will it be? It's now. It's now. It's now. I spoke with um, a young woman, part of Lighthouse, who was dealing with a bondage in her life, and it had been a bondage for many, many years, many years, from early childhood because of her family. God set her free and she took a very brave step and the enemy came against her in a dramatic way that Sunday night. It was, it was this some years ago now. The enemy rose up against her as she was in her room that night. And she said fear just swept over her and she felt totally bound, totally helpless, C couldn't even couldn't even say a word, couldn't even speak. And she said, finally, it, it, was, it was as if it was just a small bubble. Jesus, Jesus, I praise you, Jesus. You and I don't have to scream and shout. Jesus hears our weakest whisper some of you this morning, you feel like, I can't, I'm so, I can't even lift my hands up to praise the Lord. That's what that young lady said as well. But Jesus rose up in her and defeated the roaring enemy in her face, as he will do for you. If you are in bondage this morning, call out to Jesus. If you are oppressed this morning, 
and just I encourage you just to, to close your eyes. Stephen, could you just play play the guitar, please, or just just play quietly? We're going to close with prayer. This morning, you may. I, I want to just speak very specifically. Some of you are oppressed with, it may be, you say, well, I'm demon possessed. No, I'm not saying that at all. But you may be oppressed. Some of you are struggling with depression this morning. And I understand, because I've dealt with it too. And I've struggled with it too. And it's awful. You feel like you're in a swamp and there's no way to walk out. Or your heart is just so sad and so heavy. Jesus can lift your heart. Jesus can get you out. If he could deliver instantly, if he could deliver a demon-possessed slave girl in bondage who could not free herself, do you think it's any problem for him to set you free this morning? I'd like us just to call out to Jesus this morning. If you are fine this morning and your heart is free, I ask you to do something else. I ask you right now to begin to pray for other people who are seated here this morning. Just begin to pray. And the Lord may bring somebody to mind. I want you to call them by name. But for those of you that say, Pastor Jennifer, you're talking to me. You're talking to me. We're going to pray for you this morning. And you're going to, I just say, just, just say Jesus. Jesus. And if you want to raise your hand and let me see as we pray, you can do that, and I'll just I'll acknowledge you. Then you can put your hand back down if you want to. But the Jesus who set the slave girl free in Philippi is the Jesus who's walking up and down these aisles this morning who says, I want to set you free. I don't want you to keep struggling with depression. I want to lift you from that. I want to lift the burden of guilt and condemnation from you. Your heart is sad. I want to make your heart glad. I want you to know that the year of my favor is here and it is upon you. Jesus, we come to you this morning. Lord, we don't want to wait any longer. We don't want to walk around in bondage. We know the truth in our heads. Lord, just like that demon-possessed slave girl shouted out, these are servants of the Most High God who bring salvation. We know this truth, Lord. We can say these, these truths with our mouths. But in our hearts and in our lives, Lord, some of us are so bound, so captive, and we're so tired of it. Would you come and set us free this morning? Would you come and set us free? Would you come and set us free? I urge you, if that's you this morning, just begin to say, Jesus. You don't have to shout. You can be louder if you want to. Just say, Jesus, Jesus, set me free. Jesus, set me free. Jesus, deliver me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask you just to reach out your hands. Would you just reach out your hands to one another or reach your hands to the Lord this morning and just begin to pray. Just begin to pray and just say, Jesus, just say, Lord, your freedom. Lord, your favor. Lord, your deliverance. May it rain down upon your people. And Stephen, if there's a song that would be good for us, you just let me know. Hallelujah. Just begin to don't don't